There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with an amazing young woman by the name of Michelle Hughes. Michelle, how are you? Thank you, Jay. I love that you said an amazing young woman. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess experience well, gives me some uh, degree of longevity, but uh, I guess thank you so much for that compliment anyway. You're welcome. And, and as I always tell people, we're only as old as we feel, and you and I are engaged in the practice of biohacking and age regression, so... We're far older cellular or far younger cellularly than most people half our age. But uh, let me give you guys uh, her background. She is a San Francisco based CEO and entrepreneur, and she has a podcast, which I was recently on, which is the ageless and timeless podcast, which is about four years old. And her and I had a very profound conversation. So today we are going to continue our conversation, but let me just kind of get your um, you know feedback. We have a bunch of talking points. We're going to get into your story, but as I've been doing now, and by the way, today is October 5th, 2023. Mm. Uh, I like to ask my, my hosts, I mean, my guests when they come on, like what's their opinion right now of humanity? Like, obviously, you know, if you're a glass half uh, empty person, you could say that we're heading towards transhumanism and it's crazy. Um, you know, all the different potential outcomes and permutations. But if you're a glass half full person, you could say the world's in the most amazing place. We're in a total biomedical revolution right now. As you and I talked about on your podcast and as we've had on other conversations offline, there's so many amazing technologies that are out there in the biomedical space right now that for people to take advantage of. So it's kind of like a catch 22, but like Michelle, where do you see us going mm -hmm. three to five to 10 years from now? Well, I'm so happy you asked that question because it's a very, very important question. There's a lot of reasons today to be very divisive and very discouraged with what the world is uh, in the macro sense. Uh, in, in, in terms of what you just laid out, though, I think the glass is overflowing in terms of the longevity and the health world. Um, I did have the pleasure of hearing Peter Diamandis speak at the American Academy of Anti-Aging last December. And I must say his speech is pr pretty much sizes up how you and I, I know you feel the same way, so I'll just include you, uh, feel about uh, the health and wellness world. And the, I think we said on, on my podcast, or you said that the health experience today is like in five in the last five years we've gained about a hundred years worth of knowledge and awareness and, and experience so just uh, just take uh, artificial intelligence that's just one biohack and what that's going to do and this is what peter diamandis uh laid out in his speech that you know all the the technology that is available just through ai and then you add into that all the uh, other technologies like stem cells and DNA testing and, um, you know, just the whole human genome and how you can start looking at your genes as a way to guide you, uh, not make you feel stuck, but guide you to uh, well, healthy living by making some adjustments once you know what your genetic disposition is. So that, that in itself is a huge a milestone in the wellness world. And, you know, you and I, Jay, we, we both know that functional medicine is the answer, at least in our microcosm world, uh, for our own purposes. Why would we ever want to take a bunch of pharmaceutical drugs that have uh, a lot of side effects that cause you to have to take more drugs in order to fix the side effects that the original drug caused? And, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, I think that that allopathic medicine has its place 
and in a crisis. But I think from the day-to-day -day management of our health, we are so lucky that we have what's happening today in technologically in the health world. So that's my answer. I would say the glass is overflowing. That's awesome. Great answer. Uh, yeah. And I agree. I mean, you know, to get to unpack the allopathic medicine, I, I, I really, I really do want to say that allopathic medicine had a day and a, a day, place, and time. Obviously, the one thing I've always been against with allopathic medicine is the vaccine stuff, but that's not that's not a conversation to get in here today. But obviously, before we had supplements and before we had all these adjuvants like peptides and you know, just call it functional wellness uh, adjuvants, supplements, medicines, all these different things, these different applications, it played a role. But like everything else, as we've now evolved as a species and we're evolving as a society, everything is more and more becoming decentralized. And now people are obviously learning that they have to become personally responsible, right? Because you and I both know that 50 years ago, we all had family doctors right. and those people, it, to bless their hearts and to their credit, literally were encouraged to actually find out about us and actually know about our health history and to take care, you know, to actually take great cause and concern for us. But as you know, now with insurance and all the crap that's happened in the last 20 years, doctors have no time to be involved in anybody's business. And so if you're not going to involve your own self, your own, you know, what I would call higher self in your own personalized healthcare, then your doctor's not going to do it. And ultimately you're going to be led down a path of sickness, illness, and disease. And obviously that's not what you and I are about. So, you know, we always have to say that there was a place in time that, you know, doctors played a great role, but nowadays that role has diminished. And as you said, it's really now just about crisis management. You know, I always say this to people, Michelle, and I think I said this to you off air, but I wouldn't go to a doctor today unless I literally was gut shot or had a piece of shrapnel sticking out of me you know, where I needed to be sutured. I, I needed to have it removed medically and then sutured so that I didn't bleed out. Because other than that, I mean, I can pretty much ma manage and handle my own healthcare. I don't even, I, I don't even believe in any of the diagnostic testing. I think that's a scam. I think that they look to find things for people. And then, as you know, we are ultimately the great reality creators. So if we're in fear of something, we usually, you know, vibrate it into our energy field to experience it and to evolve and grow from it. So I think, I think what you said is a hundred percent accurate. We now hold the power. We have control over our future from a biomedical standpoint. And obviously, again, as you know, it's up to you how you want to live your life. You know, a lot of people choose to not take advantage or not take care of themselves, uh, eat like shit, you know, don't hormonally optimize themselves, become obese, become insulin resistant, uh, right. not to experiment with all the great things that you and I talk about on our podcast, like peptides and supplements and hormone optimization and all those things. And that's fine. Everybody has their own free will and prerogative. But very clearly now we have the ammunition to take our to take our health into our own hands. And as you know, to totally extend our life. Right. I mean, there's absolutely no reason you and I cannot live to 120, even I would say even 130, 150 years old right. and not be decrepit, bent over, you know, with bone mineral uh, density compromise or, or osteopenia. Uh, and be strong and robust. There's absolutely no reason to see it. I mean, I mean, obviously, I think we're going to be the first generation or society that does that. But, um, you know, I just look around at my parents' generation and I look at, you know, even people that are a little bit older than that, you know, baby boomers post-World War II. And they didn't know what we know. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't understand about weight training or getting enough protein or, you know, God knows we're not getting into peptides or hormone optimization, but they just, they're, they're so far behind the knowledge that we have now. And so it just, it's pretty simple to extrapolate that like, if we just keep doing what we're doing, knowing what we're knowing, obviously taking advantage of these wondrous uh, inventions and, you know, acoustic wave and, you know, biomedical healing and red light and all the things that you and I have been talking about. There's no reason, Michelle, to, to think that we can't live, like I said, to 130 to 140, even to 150, but be robust and strong in doing it. You know, I, I do think having a, a functional medicine doctor to, you can turn to and ask questions to kind of get through a lot of the clutter, because let's face it, when something is is emerging, and, and this is a very entrepreneurial world, and there are so many options, that's what scares me a bit. Not If you don't have a, a doctor that understands all of what's going on and, and can you know see through a lot of the clutter in terms of what options to choose and knows your situation personally, I, I do think that that is a, a good 
way, particularly for someone who's moving from the allopathic to the functional side of the world and, and embracing this self-help uh, approach that you're just espousing, uh, it, it does help to have someone that you can turn to or, you know, even just a mentor like you just mentioned to me uh, that you just did a podcast with someone that's been your mentor, maybe not a medical doctor, but someone that you can bounce ideas off yeah. of. One of the things my my doctor is, um, uh, I have one doctor in Beverly Hills and she's wonderful and her name is Dr. Nina Sashdev. And um, she's, she's studied under um, uh, Jeffrey Bland, who every, you know, anybody in the functional world knows he's one of the, the, the great minds of uh, functional medicine. So anyway, she, she's very, very smart and, and she knows a lot, but she said to me the other day something that really concerns me. She said, there is so much going on in this world because it's it is entrepreneurial, so you know, and you get our, I get articles all the time about all these startups that are in the by you know the um, biomedical side that uh, Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and you know the whole group of the tech billionaires are all be behind. So that's 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 on the you know the uh, emerging uh, technology side. But then you have all these options like you and I, just, you just mentioned you know, a whole list of them. And how do you know which to choose? And, and you, need, you do need some professional that is a medical doctor that will help you to at least choose the right ones. And even just, t just take supplements. I mean, there are, you take, you look at the, you go on Amazon, you look at B complex and there's like 50, options to choose from. Well, how do you know which one is the right one? And how do you get through that clutter of, of, of all the choices? So I think it could be very confusing, particularly for someone that's unlike us, who is just jumping on to this side of the uh, self-care world. And I don't know if do you agree with that, Jay? No, I definitely do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, I mean, obviously you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, people like us, I don't think needed as much. I mean, I mean, I'm more knowledgeable than 99.9% .9 of doctors, but that's because I've spent 30 years of my life combing through the research, you know, reading the studies. Whereas today the average doctor, not a functional medicine doctor, but an allopathic doctor, as you know, doesn't have the time to do any of that. I mean, they have to see so many patients a day that their life is not, you know, relegated to like spending time and working on their patients, but functional medicine doctors, and obviously the doctors that I work with and you work with and network with are all back to that way, way of doing business where they actually have a personal relationship with their patients. Yeah. And it, it, so it's, it's kind of separated. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm in total agreement because like, I mean, obviously I have five or six docs right now that if I have a question that I have absolutely no idea how to answer, I, I can message them and say, Hey, what do you know about this? Or, or, you know, this was given to me, uh, by a, by a, uh, you know, somebody in one of my private groups or something like that. And I've never heard about this, but what are your thoughts on this? So, yeah. And, and obviously technology gives us, uh, access to be able to do that. So, um, that's awesome though, that you do have a confidant. I mean, I, I have a, a lot, let's just say I have a ton of doctors that I would go to, oh. not like one specific one. Right. Um, but I, I, you know, again, we're all different. I mean, you know, if you do end up finding out like one great one, like, you know, with yours, I'm sure, you know, the, you, you, you do hormonal optimization with, and she's been really good for you. Then I would never leave that. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, I've just been in kind of like a, a path of like the last 20 years of just total self-discovery where I went from like one doctor to another doctor and each doctor I learned something from. So I'm always like grateful to have those experiences and to have those relationships. And it's not like I won't go back to them, but I'm now definitely at a place where it's like, if somebody asked me like, who's your doctor? I'd say, I don't have one. I said, that's the Dr. Jay Campbell. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I mean, I, I have doctors I consult with and obviously I have doctors that write scripts for me, but I don't have like an actual personal doctor. Cause I, pers I choose to use like who I must or who I desire to use, like at that place in time when that, when it's necessary. But I, I totally agree with you. Like, for people that are not familiar with the world that you and I live in to have like one person that they can bounce ideas off of is amazing. And you, you know, know I mean? mentioned one doctor, but just like you, because of my podcast, I am obviously in a position and an enviable position to be able to pick up the phone or do it just like you just said and text someone that uh, if I want to know more about, for example, plasmalogens, which most people have never even <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I happen to have had Dr. Dane Goodnow, who is the, you know, the king of the mountain as far as plasmalogens. And, and he then has adopted me and I am now under his care for using, uh, I did his prodrome test, which is, you know, it helps you to know what your plasmalogen levels are and other aspects of your of your health. And uh, it is amazing just how uh, how much I've learned just from him. And then there's uh, Dr. Todd Ovakaitis in Carlsbad. He He's the stem cell king. <laughs> And, and he's doing stem cells with laser, uh, laser technology that helps to place the stem cells where they need to go. And he's become a really good, uh, uh, well, he was a guest and then he became a really good friend. And so, yeah, so there's, there's so many specialties. And, you know, we, you just touched on, you know, six or seven of them, but there's, there are the others too, you know, and, and, and um, oh, and, and this next week, Dr. Khan, Kashif Khan is coming on my show and I, he is the DNA company. Yep. Yep. And I had Gil Blander, who is the uh, inside tracker, both do the, you know, the genetics. And uh, I, I, I mean, I could go on and on. I don't want to bore you or your, or yeah. your but all I can tell you is that uh, what I'm learning is just to try to um, minimize the dead ends because I've spent, like you told me about your wife, you know, spending all this money. I have done the same thing. I've spent yeah. a ton of money on things that, that didn't work. And, and that's such a downer for, you know, people who are just neophytes and trying to get, you know, into a world where they understand that they are taking responsibility for their own health with the guidance of a professional or professionals. However, not every person's biochemistry is different. So what might work for you might not work for me at all. That's and beautifully stated. It's, I, I want to read you. Uh, so this, the person that you mentioned that again, somebody, and, and by the way, we're talking about Frederick Dodson for people to know, cause they're going to be watching the podcast, but I, I posted this quote. I'm looking for it right now from one of his books that I just recently read, which I think well, is I, profound. I, I've heard of Frederick Dodson and I now have to go back and look. At <laughs> I'm going to have to tell you which books to get, but I want you to read this. I'll read this quote because it's relevant to what you just said. I'm literally looking for it right now. Okay. My group is so full of people posting information. There it is. Okay. Uh, so this is his quote. Listen to this, Michelle, how profound this is. Having coached people since the early 1990s, I've probably met tens, if not hundreds of thousands of personal people personally. My primary observation is that humans, this is, now, I, I, well, I'm going to stop this. This is how profound this is. This is one of those things when I read it, I was like, whoa. My primary observation is that humans weaken themselves the most mm -hmm. by being lost in thought mm -hmm. rather than action, concept rather than experience, mm -hmm. and opinions rather than skills. Oh, that is amazing. He's so- I mean, Think about that. <laughs> Well, look, you know, your thoughts create your reality and right. we, are, we are all energetic beings. That's so right. if you think something, you're you're putting that energy out into the universe. That's right. And what? You're going to attract that back. So if you're thinking negative, you're going to attract negative. And if you're thinking confusion, you're going to attract confusion. So, so much of being alive in, in vital is to make the right choices because your choices define you. So what he just said is, is one about positive thinking, yeah. you know, first step, and and then action, taking action yes. that is deliberate and intentional, and of course the results, you know, hopefully are beneficial. So, but but to uh, that point, but to that point, and I don't want to stop you because you're you're making a very strong point, and I want to echo what you're saying is that unfortunately the younger people of today, because the technology is again ubiquitous, and there's so many people, as you said. The signal to noise ratio has never been higher. We have a massive signal and or a lot of noise and a very low quality signal. So as you said earlier in the show, it's very hard to discern. That's why you want to have a, you know an army or hopefully a group of private specialists to bounce ideas off of. But like the younger people today, they get caught up in the thinking part, right? Like they literally get so caught up in the thought, right? Like I think of it like to make it simpler is I think about all these data tracking devices. And so many people get caught up in like tracking data 
and creating spreadsheets and, you know, my sleep data or my HRV score, all this stuff. And it's like, no, dude, like the reality is, is all you have to do is just show up consecutively, consistently okay. over time and do the things that everybody knows we all supposed to do because everybody says the same thing. At the end of the day, we're all saying the same thing and maybe it'd be spun different ways or, you know, but at the end of the day, but the problem is Michelle, that people get so stuck in the thought process of questioning, like, is this what I'm supposed to do that they don't take action, which is what you were saying. And so like, when we don't take action, we don't create, we don't actually accomplish much because we get so lost in the thought. And I'm telling you, I, I, I take these questions from people every day in my private groups and messages. And right. it's like, you know, dude, my heart rate is not where it needs to be because, you know, I read your book and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, who gives a shit if your heart rate isn't between 120 and 140 every day you do your cardio? The real question is, are you doing your cardio every day or are you doing what you're supposed to do? You know what I mean? So it's like they're why his quote is so profound and you were explaining it and why I wanted to reiterate is that it's about doing the work right. versus focusing on the things that you think are important with outside of doing the work. Right. Well, you know, there's that whole, the same analysis paralysis. Right. So get caught up in all the data and you don't take action. All you're doing basically is suffocating yourself with data. And, you know, the, the whole point of life is a, a lifelong journey. I mean, having a life that is a lifelong journey is that you're always learning new things. However, you're sifting through the data in order to get to some action. So this is one of the benefits of having been an entrepreneur in my my life as a real estate developer and as a corporate executive, in both cases, you know, if you didn't do something with the data or with the, let's just say you have a, pro, a challenge in front of you with a, a, an employee and that's just a human, this is now the human side. And of course, running any company, you're always going to have the human challenges as well as the technical challenges of just running the company in, in terms of its, its whatever its product or service is. So, and, and always being out in front progressively of, of, you know, what's happening in your world and in your industry. But the human side is always the more challenging because it's so, um, well, it can be very, very uh, subtle, but um, also very difficult because people are people. So I, 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 um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, as far as, I, I don't know if it's generational, um, do you it think probably is. It, it probably is because of the internet and because of all the technology. Yeah, because they grew up without having to actually. I mean, I, I'll I'll tell you why I know it's generational. I talk about this all the time with people our age and stuff like that about this. But you and I grew up in a world where we had to find. You literally had to seek and find. Exactly. Whereas now these kids, literally, I I mean, I joke about this all the time, and I don't have my phone in front of me, which is a good thing. But like, they ask the screen, Michelle, for the answer. And well, then what's even more insane, and you know, you and I know this because we talked about this on our last podcast, they think the screen is telling them the truth. <laughs> well, and, they, and you know, they, this is where um, artificial intelligence is, is the scary side because right. now we're going to rely, or in the future, as the future unfolds, we're relying on a screen, just like you're saying. We're relying on, an, on a, a, a robot. <laughs> Well, I, I asked my 13 year old daughter, I know I talked about this with you before, but I asked my 13 year old daughter all the time. And, you know, all those kids, no matter how much you limit their devices, they're on TikTok, they're on Instagram, they're, you know, they're on these things. And I ask her questions sometimes about history mm -hmm. and it's startling, mm -hmm. astonishing, the lack of knowledge that they have that again, because the AI, the screen, whatever you want to call it, the technological overlords. Right. are blocking certain things out from our past. And as you know, if you really want to program a culture, yeah, don't let them know about the past, right? Because if you're don't if you're not aware of the past, you're doomed to re repeat the mistakes repeat that it. your past progenitors made. Exactly. Yeah. It's mind blowing. But yeah, I, I mean it, it's I mean we could go so many different ways with this, but like the reality is is that you and I grew up in a world where we had to go to the library. If we wanted to get information, we literally had to go to the library. 
Yes. We had to pull out the Dewey Decimals card stack. We had to pull the card out, give it to the library. And then the librarian had to go back to the book file, wherever it was in the library, which could take 20 minutes. And right. then they would bring the book out and give it to you. And then you would have to sign for it to even have it. And then you couldn't highlight it. You, right. you had to actually read it and take notes. Right. You know, so but but again, the, the the process of this is that you and I pursued knowledge. There was a there was a rite of patches passage in pursuing the knowledge, and you valued and cherished the pursuit because you knew you had to learn it. Whereas again, these kids today, and again, I'm not talking bad about them or judging them or condemning them, but hey Siri, hey Alexa, mm -hmm. hey Google. And then they get the answer and then they just cut and paste it and regurgitate it or they put it into a note on their phone or whatever the ways they do things now. But Michelle, what do they learn? You know, that's like the height of plagiarism in a sense because they're relying on some third party or second party, and you know, to, to give them an answer that they haven't really invested the time to research and, and like you just described, uh, find the answers on their own. So yeah, you know, you have a really, really good point here. That's a, kind of a lazy uh, approach and uh, that you know makes people want quick they always say that you know that they want people want like in health let's just say they want answers they want results without really investing the effort to get those results like go to a doctor and get an antibiotic when you have the first sign of a sniffle right right well, yeah. right you know, antibiotics are like setting off an, a, 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 an atomic bomb in your GI tract. Right. And you have to work really, really hard to overcome all the bad effects. There are some good effects in some cases. Uh, however, all the side effects of the lack of probiotic, you, you, you and I know what, what it means to lose not only the good flora, but the bad flora. So yeah. there's an example of wanting something quick a quick fix. However, there are so many other options that if you were patient and would just invest the time and the energy to do it in a different way, taking, you know, other things for colds that are more gentle, um, maybe it won't be fixed tomorrow, but you won't have all the other residual negatives of, of the choice. I, I think technology, to, to, yes, uh, I'm in total agreement. I think to, just to summarize it and get into your story here in a second is that technology has made people lazy. You know, we, we, we have allowed, and again, it's a choice. Everything is always a consent by the individual, but technology has given us easy street, you know, yeah. Kids today grow up in abundance. They never have wanted for anything. They never had to work hard for anything. They never had to earn anything. I mean, you look at these kids today, Michelle, you know, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but when you grow up in a world where you never have to do anything to get anything, when there's literally an app for that an easy button for everything, right? Like if they're hungry, they push a button on their phone and the food's at their door. I know. Right. So when, when you look at that kind of a world and then you contrast it with like Aboriginal culture or rainforest cultures, which, by the way, are still going on around the world today, you know, with people that actually learn like an ecological hierarchy of the world of like, hey, you know what, like if you want to eat, you got to go catch a fish or you got to go, you know, net an animal or you got a spear or whatever it is you got to do. I mean, those people value their life from a standpoint of like the pursuit of whatever it is you ultimately desire requires effort and work versus today our younger people with technological enslavement they don't have to do anything and they get whatever they want and as you know that kills curiosity and it also breeds a lack of contentment because what 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 there's no challenges you know this is so interesting jay i'm, I'm really really pleased to get on this track of some something philosophical. I mean, we have a lot of technical things that we both are very uh, passionate about, but this is something that kind of, it's like the umbrella over the entire um, genre of not just health, but life. Yeah, and, life. And I mean, I know we, you know, we are focused on the health uh, aspect, but the, this is really much bigger than that. If I were, uh, 30 years younger today and, you know, grew up with that sense of entitlement, which you neither you, either you or I did. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, I grew up in an upper middle class family, but they never, my father and mother always encouraged us to work hard. I grew yep. up in Boston and, you know, the 
Puritan work ethic was sure. working. Uh, and, you know, my father always said, you will never get anything in life unless you work for it. Well, you know, when you and in, that's ingrained in you, you never are going to have a sense of entitlement. You know that, you know, that last call that you make at night before you go home might just be the call that changes your destiny. That's so right. don't make that call. Don't just shut the, the, you know, the phone down or the computer down or whatever it is these days and go home. And, you know, so there has to be a cutoff point, but, you know, never, ever give up. I, I, that's one of the mantras that, you know, I use all the time. And there have, when we get into my little background, you know, I can tell you so many times that I've been challenged in the business world, in life. And yet I always remembered my upbringing and never, ever give up. It's like Humpty Dumpty. If you're broken, put the pieces back together again and 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 start afresh. So yeah. I'm happy well, that we're talking all about this because it does overlay onto the choices that one makes about their health care. Yeah, I mean, look, well, it's a perfect segue. So, I mean, why don't you tell a little bit about your backstory? Well, real simply, I mean, I'm one of those people that found out what I was passionate about really, really young in my life. And so I've been able to follow a path that was really why I'm meant to be here. And I know a lot of people never get that message about why are you here? Yeah. So you know, I started out in, as a teacher, actually, and then I moved. I knew that wasn't right for me, but I, I had a master's degree and I... I taught in high school and, you know, the kids were only a couple of years younger than me. So that was an interesting experience. But I learned a lot about communication. And I wrote a paper for the University of Massachusetts years ago. They asked me, I was an you know, English major at the time. And when I graduated and they saw that I had gone into business and they follow you, you know, when they see that you're successful, they they ask you for, you know, certain things. So they asked me to write a paper to put in the library. And that paper I chose to write was on the value of an English, being an English major or a communication. Nice. Because the communication is the basis of everything. Everything, yeah. And I didn't know that at the time. I mean, so being a teacher helps you because if you can't keep the class uh, attention, then you, you're failing in your communication. So, uh, so that was the first chapter. And the second chapter was the corporate world, where I spent 20 years of just being a, an executive at a, at a consulting, a big New York based consulting firm. And that taught me a lot about people skills uh, because I was interacting with the top, you know, I, I was only in my 20s, but I was interacting with executives in their, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. And so I had to be pretty sharp um, with knowledge and, and kind of a life experience that would resonate with them. And particularly being a woman in those years, you know, that in itself was a, a hurdle. So I, I give a lot of credit to, you know, the fact that I was very curious and reading a lot and, and studying. And I always found people like you with Fred Dodson. I found people to emulate. So I was lucky because I was living in San Francisco. I was a newcomer here, I was, you know, from Boston, but now via New York, I ended up here in the West Coast. And um, I, for some reason, I was uh, adopted uh, by Cyril Magnin, who you don't know because he's a local, but he was the, the chief of protocol of San Francisco and he ran two very big uh, retail stores, uh, I Magnin and J Magnin, both you know, and he went, he taught me so much about uh, business and also about philanthropy because he was a great, you know, very successful executive and a great philanthropist. So, so I was very lucky that he sponsored me and took me to a lot of events. And uh, I, so I had a great experience in the corporate world, always learning from men all, and they were all men, by the way, at the time. So I was always the only woman. Uh, but, you know, I was invited to d different things that taught me so much about how to interact with, with and learn from uh, people of experience and, and, and success. So, so that was that chapter. Then uh, one day I decided to move into real estate. I had been dabbling in real estate development in San Francisco, well, in Tiburon, where I live, and Belvedere, and a little bit down in the Silicon Valley, and but doing it all part time. 
So at night, you know, or after work or on the weekends, you know, my husband and I were partnering up with some friends and we would invest in these properties. The good news was both of us, my husband was an attorney and an investment banker. And the good news was we, we started to make some money enough so that we could put money into investments. So that was my first dabbling in entrepreneurialism and getting out of, segue out of the corporate world into the uh, startup world of, of real estate. So I did that and then spent 25 years. I mean, that's been my career really. And I was lucky enough to open the door for some, or have the door open for some pretty big deals. I, I, I bought a 7,000 acre property on the island of Kauai um, I did some pretty big major homes in Aspen where I uh, either, either gutted them and started from scratch or I remodeled them. But I, I had, you know, six like very, very big properties. Now, you know, take, this is a good example of having to go, go uh, going into a field where you've had no training and you learn by doing. Yeah. And I remember when I was a teacher, there was a philosopher named Bruner. And he, his, his whole philosophy was based on you learn by doing. And so I learned tennis by doing, I learned golf by doing, and I learned business by doing. So I only advocate that to people that I know like you who will resonate to that because a lot of people think you have to do, you know, so much training. And, no. but, but I believe that you learn from the people that you, that you uh, interact with and the people who know what they're doing. And you ask a lot of questions. And so anyway, I feel very proud of the, you know, the real estate accomplishments over the, the experience, 25 years of experience, because there I actually learned um, to do something that I had no upbringing in, but yet I ended up being at the top of my game. So, and then uh, the 2008 came and that, you know, you know what happened then. A lot of real estate people were devastated. I was miraculously saved by my um, willingness to sell properties at that time that were in my portfolio that were not going to get the, the, the outcome they were supposed to get, but I was unwilling to uh, carry along and have banks be vulnerable. So I, I knew I would never, ever go through a foreclosure. So I sold off uh, about six properties during that time of 2008 to 12 and got out of the the um, the horrible period of the nightmare that every, a lot of developers had that just they walked away and they, they basically filed bankruptcy. So I was able to move through that. Then I, I've always been interested in health, I, you know, since I was in my 20s. And I, I was one of the first people that ever went to what was then a health food store back in the, in the day. And of course, they, they hadn't really uh, ev emerged as the way that we know them today. But I was very interested in health. I remember I followed a woman named Adele Davis. Um, she, she was an author and, you know, she was like a guru at the time back in, the, I think, the 70s. And then anyway, I, um, I just knew that health and wellness was at that time an avocation. But now with the podcast and with the amount of time that I spend researching and being like you, just entrenched in this world, I know it's really my, uh, another one of my callings. So, so basically I've had two really big callings. The one from real estate was more left brain analytical but had a creative side because you have to be a visionary. But the health and wellness both as well is left brain because you want to analyze uh, data that is much without getting you know overwhelmed by it. And then, but at the same time, recognizing uh, trends and and being uh, visionary about where the world is going and and taking responsibility. So that's pretty much it. The podcast started in 2019, right before COVID, and uh, that was interesting because COVID happened in early 20. And then I was doing my podcast from LA at the time and just making that effort to, instead of doing it remotely, I was doing it from the studio. But it was so important to me to get the word out to people and, and start the whole purpose of my podcast is to help people to get through um, their questions about how to take care of themselves and how to be the best version of themselves. 
And by the way, I, I also have had a lot of entrepreneurs who are not always healthcare people, but people who are just like you and me. We're, we're executives, but we're taking care of ourselves first. Yeah. And then yeah. we want to share that knowledge with others. So I've had people like that who are role models for good health in, in businesses that are not uh, that are unrelated to uh, health, but have their health has been their goalposts for uh, touchdowns in in the in the world of whatever their business they're practicing. So that's awesome. I, I think a lot of people. I, thank you for sharing your backstory with us. Um, and just so you know, because you don't know, uh, we have actually a very similar background. So I, did, but I actually started real estate at the end of the decline, or what I would like to say, like the beginning of the ascent, which was like actually in 2012. Now I was. Um, due to success that I had at an early time in my life. In my late in my late twenties, I started investing in uh the dot com before it became the dot com bubble and I made a lot of money. I mean, I literally tell people that I invested fifty seven hundred dollars in Lucent Technologies, Yahoo, oh. Google, and Apple. And that fifty seven hundred dollars was like six hundred and eighty thousand dollars in like a year and a half, right? So I used that money and I started buying properties uh in California at the bottom of the basement in Pasadena until I had a real estate portfolio worth, you know, a, a mid little higher than mid seven figures, mm-hmm. uh, in 2000 and, um, let's say 2001. Yeah. 2001. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and as you know, everything blew up, but I got out. I mean, I was out I mean, my money was in real estate and then that blew up as you know, uh, all the way up until like 2006, 2007, before the collapse in 2008. But so I was a landlord in the early two thousands in LA. Right. Um, and God knows I would never do that ever again because I saw, you know, people think, Oh, you know, the money is in recurring and, you know, owning, owning property and having renters and all that stuff. But I mean, man, I had duplexes and I saw how much work was involved in, you know, the landlord aspect of it and, and, and hiring property managers and all that stuff. But then, uh, I met my current wife, Monica. Um, well, actually, it, 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 parallel to that, I was involved in the digital marketing world. So I was working in the automotive industry and I worked for all the Bellwether, Bell Cow companies. I worked for Kelly Blue Book, Auto Trader, and Edmonds. I worked for all of them. I rose very high. I was an executive in two out of those three companies. But at the same time, um, I was also dealing with the same shit that you were dealing with, which was like, you know, getting out of my properties and getting out of the corporate rental programs I was in and and navigating that, you know, debacle of 2008 to 2011. And then uh, basically after my divorce uh, in 2012, I met my current wife and my current wife was a very successful residential real estate uh, agent in Los Angeles. And after we we met on match.com and (laughs) after we started talking and spent, you know, a couple months together dating and stuff like that. And she found out what I did. She was like, why don't you come and work with me? Because all the, you know, digital marketing ninja shit that you do uh, is what I need for my business. You know, like I, I, I can't do all this stuff. And so I was like, well, you know, cause I was a, not an entrepreneur. I was a wage slave, just a highly functioning, highly paid wage slave. <laughs> but mm-hmm. once I started looking into what she was doing, um, I was like, ah, you know what, why not? You know? And, it, it, and at that point in my life, this was, if this was going to be my third marriage, which it turned out to be that way, I was like, uh, this is my last shot. Right. And she was so amazing with my two daughters who were, you know, very young at the time. I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. And from 2012 to 2000 and our first year together, we did almost a hundred million dollars in just with just two people in residential real estate sales. Oh, and goodness. yeah, it was, I mean, it was, I mean, she was a very successful realtor, but she didn't have the digital marketing background that I had. So I was able to take my super ninja tactics and combine them with her experience. And we built a real estate team. And then Michelle, honestly, over the next six years, uh, you know, we built up a very sizable, very successful residential real estate team in Los Angeles. We had uh, what well, my claim to fame is that at one time we had, we were the fourth highest team with five star reviews on Google and Yelp in Southern California. So I basically built her a business that was, and obviously she had a part in it too, but uh, that was, you know, recession proof because people called us to sell their house, you know, right. and then we had, you know, a bunch of buyers, agents, and all that. But I got out of all of that at the same time that you started your podcast, which was mm-hmm. like in 2019 to become whatever I am now, which, you know, people ask me, Jay, what are you? And I say, I'm an online gypsy. I just have, I'm a nightmare to my accountant. I have revenue streams that are coming in from all these different places 
And it's all because of all the work I've done online and stuff like that over the years and stuff like that. But anyway, it's an interesting story because we have that's, a very similar background. We do, we really do. But all of those experiences led us to be the people that we are now today because from those varied backgrounds of, of business and, you know, the experiences that we had and the things that we do, it allows us to have better engaging conversations, I think, with the people that we speak with in the health optimization world. Absolutely. And diversity, too. I mean, we've obviously dabbled, not even dabbled, we've been entrenched in a different uh, industries. So it gives us a, a, a plethora of experience that makes us wiser. And, you know, I, I've never, I, I don't give up on real estate today. I still have a portfolio. However, uh, I won't put new money into real estate at this point because of all the dis disruption that's going on yeah. in the world. Yeah. So but it doesn't mean that I don't still love real estate. Yeah. And you, uh, underneath it all, what guides me and propels me is the, my love of beauty. And, and when I say beauty, I'm talking not only aesthetic beauty of, you know, a, a surrounding in a home, or, but the beauty of the inside and the outside. So I look you know, at all the people that have worked for me. I always look for their, you know, inner beauty as much as their outer, as far as whether they're going to be good teammates. And I'm sure you did that. You and Monica did that, right? But For sure. It for sure. But, but this is part of being alive today. And, you know, just aside from all the health and the interest in wellness, a, a super imposed on all of that is a person's character. And, and honestly, I don't mean to say that if you're not doing the things that you and I do, that you don't have character. It just means that you haven't been enlightened yet. And, and, and enlightenment really does mean first and foremost, having an inner sense of self, of being confident and wanting answers. Like you said before, it's not about analyzing data. It's about taking action. And so, yes, I think we're what we're doing now is coalescing with all the experiences we've had. And they're all now in a, in a kind of a, a, a bucket. And we can now pick and choose how we want to spend our time. And the nice thing is we've had some success in life financially that allows us to make some some choices that are very personal. And that, and, and as you know, yeah, well said. And as you know, that success came because we were willing to take chances and we were willing to put ourselves out there and we were willing to work through the inevitable downs, right? Because just as many ups, there's just as many downs. And if anything, there's probably two or three times as many downs as there are ups just to get there. But every experience is valuable if you don't label it as a negative experience and as an opportunity for growth and advancement. But I do want to jump into talking about hair, uh, hair regrowth and peptides and hormone optimization with you because that's kind of where we left off. But it's cool yes. to get both of our backstories. Yes. Um, so we didn't talk about hair growth. We, we, we I, have, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was watching several of your podcasts with uh, people like the Mind Pump people, and 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 uh, you know you do an incredible job as a on as Thank being you. a guest on other people's podcasts in addition to being a host on your own. But I I was listening to you talk about DHT, and and I had been telling everybody that I what I thought was that DHT was a very good. Um, uh, formula to take in order to reduce the amount of hair loss. And then I hear you saying, no, DHT is a big waste of time. So can you, could you clarify for me and for others who are using DHT? Yeah. So, 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 um, it, it, so if, so it is complicated and, uh, you know, I'll be happy to in this podcast link to the article that we wrote originally for Ben Greenfield's website, which we then published on my website after it went on his as a can canonical URL because we added a bunch of material to it. But it's a 10,000 word article. It was actually bits and pieces of it have been picked up and published in the New York Times. But it really is the probably current latest and greatest understanding slash awareness of hair loss in today. And so originally, and I would say when I say originally going back 25 years. Uh, the theory of hair loss was that we wanted to inhibit dihydrotestosterone, which is DHT, right. because DHT, uh, which has unbelievable amount of positive correlative effects in both male and female health, it enhances well-being, it enhances, um, you know, uh, the quality of people's skin, 
Um, it does all of the anabolic cascades that are found from testosterone. Uh, in fact, DHT is three to four times more anabolic than the testosterone molecule itself. But the original theory was that DHT also causes hair loss because what DHT does is it attaches to the follicle in the scalp. And when it attaches to the follicle in the scalp, depending on the person's androgen, uh, I'm sorry, genetic predisposition to hair loss or not, uh, it can diminutize the follicle and ultimately cause the follicle to fall out or to die prematurely or whatever. And so what ended up happening was the pharmaceutical industry built or created and still do, still does, unfortunately, drugs that uh, basically inhibit dihydrotestosterone. Now, the theory at that point in time was that by inhibiting DHT, you would prevent the further miniaturization of, uh, the, again, depending on whether you have a, a genetic predisposition to hair loss, which many people do or don't, but by inhibiting DHT, you would prevent the further miniaturization of the follicle, thereby uh, effectively lessening the uh, falling out of hair. Now, anybody who's ever used any of those DHT inhibiting drugs like, uh, you know, finasteride, they're called uh, Propecia, Proscar. There's a bunch of different names for them. Uh, they unfortunately have a horrible, not in everybody, but in the great majority, even in the people that don't report it, but they have this horrible downstream effect of um, causing sexual dysfunction. And of course, it's very simple to see from a scientific angle what happens when you inhibit dihydrotestosterone. And I always say, Michelle, to you know anybody that really wants to go into this and look into this, and obviously I've written prolifically on this and you know quoted all the science, whenever you inhibit a natural God-given biological pathway or process, you're going to have issues down the road. It's like I always say, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. So just as when you block aromatase, which is obviously inhibiting estrogen in both male or females, you're going to have downstream negative effects just as the same thing that you happen when you inhibit dihydrotestosterone. And all of these downstream negative effects are very bad at the cellular level. Now, one of the things that, you know, it's not provable yet, but it will be eventually is that inhibiting DHT or inhibiting estrogen causes telomere issues. And so within the next five to 10 years, as you start seeing all of these biological age management companies and measuring tools and technologies, and there'll be more, you know, there's true age and there's glycan age and there's a couple other people out there right now, but eventually there'll be a bunch of bis different biometric testers. <coughs> they will see that by, again, inhibiting God-given biological pathways, Mm -hmm. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul and you will see uh, issues with aging because you're, you're damaging the telomeres. You're basically shortening the telomerase expression, which is allows what obviously over time is allowing us to age gracefully or to regress in aging again, to keep our biological age younger than our chronological age. But by inhibiting DHT, inhibiting a, uh, AI, or I'm sorry, uh, aromatase again, estrogen, you're, 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 you're accelerating your, um, the, uh, the decay of your DNA, it, 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 you know, to, to summarize it. And so yeah. to go back to, to the hair loss situation, we now know that the number one cause of hair loss is blood flow restriction to the scalp. Right. Okay. So when we understand that blood flow restriction to the scalp is multifactorial and okay. can be caused by numerous things, I mean, you know, when people ask me like what truly causes hair loss, we know it's blood flow restriction. I could say it's a hundred different things, right? You could have a, uh, overexposure to, to, uh, you know, heavy metals. You could have lead contamination. You could be in an industrial factory working for 20 years without a hard hat and there's contaminants in the air. I mean, even sunlight overexposure to sunlight. There's so many, again, causal agents, micro inflammations to your scalp that eventually will cause, a, dim, a diminution or a diminutive ref, uh, effect on blood flow to the scalp that mm -hmm. you will lose hair. Now, obviously, there's also the, the biological inevitability of people that have what is called androgenic alopecia, which mm -hmm. is a predisposition genetically to lose hair. And that also comes from your mom's father's lineage. So if your dad, I'm sorry, your mother's dad has hair loss, it's like a 62 or 63%, you know, they've mapped this all out now with the genome stuff, but it's like 62 or 63% likelihood that you will also have the same genetic predisposition. And like in my family, there's six boys and three girls. There's four men that have the androgenic alopecia. Now me right now, 
I would be completely bald if I was not using a peptide based hair regrowth and, you know, hair loss stoppage solution, which right now is, uh, you know, the product that my business ex business partner, Nick Andrews created, which is uh, from a company called Intera skincare. It's called Folleton. I know you're familiar with the product and well, the I product have- is like five I- peptides, right? Yeah. There, yeah. And, and each one of those peptides works in synergy with the other to enhance what is known as angiogenesis, which is again, red blood cell formation and flow to the scalp. Uh, and then it also uh, strengthens the follicular root so that you can, you know, somewhat, you know, minimize or forestall uh, hair loss. And even in someone with a genetic predisposition uh, who has active follicles, like I do still have some hair growth. I mean, if you saw my scalp in 2020, this is pre this product. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would never, I was never ever using, uh, the DHT inhibitors because I was familiar with the sexual dysfunction they caused and I was never going to play that game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I almost had no hair. In fact, there was a company in Newport beach, California. I'm still very close friends with shout out, uh, to Logan at Vantis where they did like a henna tattoo on my scalp. So I was actually going to probably just be one of those, like, you know, uh, have a five o'clock shadow on my scalp for the rest of my life until I decided I wanted to shave it off and be Mr. Clean and Mr. Chrome Dome. And I'm fine like that anyway, because I'm obviously a muscular guy and I have short ears. I don't look bad with my head shaved, but Nick created this product. I started using it and I regrew my hair. I mean, t- to somewhat, I mean, my hair is still thin. You know, my wife will say, Oh, you're still thin, but I have plenty of hair relative to what I had in 2020. And as long as people, males or females, are living what I say, insulin controlled, uh, yeah. not flaming dumpster fires, don't have high levels of visceral body fat inflammation or insulin resistance, mm-hmm. they can get the same results. And again, irregardless, or I should say, regardless of whether or not you have a, pre- a genetic predisposition or even autoimmune hair loss, which many, many women do. Many women have had COVID hair. Uh, you know, they have all these, again, autoimmune symptoms and, and, and dysregulations that lead to, uh, you know, hormonal hair loss. And that's most of the hair loss that's found in women is hormonal related anyway. <laughs> Obviously, you start going through perimenopause, premenopause, or even menopause, and there is some hormonal hair loss. And again, as you know, and this is not avoidable, as we age, most people, not all, but most people experience hair thinning and hair shortening. Right. Again, for the same reasons I already explained, the follicular root starts to die. It doesn't regrow or re- uh, regenerate as, as it once did. And so by using these specific peptide-based products, and there's even bioregulators out there now, uh, you can simulate a healthy follicle or a younger aged follicle, which will obviously allow you to maintain some form of hair growth. But like everything else, you have to put it all into the balance because if your estrogen is, is, is diminishing and you do all the things you just said, you're still fighting an uphill battle because of your hormones. So, you know, the fact that you mentioned all the influences really sets up a challenge for someone who's trying to solve their hair loss issues, which is, you got to look at it's like it's like looking at a um, the hub of a wheel, which I th- really think are your hormones. The yep. hub, hundred percent. The spokes, the spokes on the wheel are all the things that um, you know that were uh, that you just mentioned, yep. and the influences. So yeah, so so just you know, this is like scary to me because when I did the telomere test, I came out so low, so high. I mean, I was like a one to five year old in the. Uh, Dr. Bill Lawrence, who, who's the peptide bioregulator person here in the U.S., yep. he he said he sent the test back because he thought there was a mistake. So I have been blessed with very, very good long telomeres. And yet for the last, well, probably eight months, not knowing, not knowing you, I've been taking the DHT blockers because I was seeing hair. This, I've always had very fine hair, but I was seeing yep. hair loss and I... I mean, I do take bioidentical hormones, so I couldn't figure out what what was it. But then I read the DHT blocker articles, and then now I'm going to get off of that because of what you just described. So it's well, kind I, of- I want, well, let me let me clarify something though with you because you're right, and you should get off of them for the health purposes, uh, obviously for the 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 uh, telomerase and 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 telomere shortening, but. It, for people to understand this, because I've I've you know obviously gotten in debates with people. 
it, blocking DHT will have in some people, not in all, but in some people, it will prevent hair loss. And again, for the exact reason we already discussed, it's blocking the DHT demunization of the follicle at the root. But here's the problem. In addition to causing potential sexual dysfunction and causing oxidation in the uh, telomeres and really the scalp, um, yeah. as soon as you stop taking it, and this is where it's really ugly, oh. all the hair will fall out. Oh, that's so you have to use, and this is, this happens in 98% of people that use DHT blockers when they, it's like the greatest scam ever for big pharma because they know yeah. that if somebody stops taking it, they have massive hair miniaturization and follicle fallout right away. So it's like, we tell people, and obviously we have a video on this and we've, you know, done, you know, who knows how many videos, private videos on this and stuff like that and written articles on this, but you want to take it doesn't have to be our product, although our product is still the strongest product in the world. In fact, I literally just had two emails, uh, well, actually messages on WhatsApp and emails from Chris Gethin, who I know you know, who's a huge you know, global influencer. Nick sent him the product. Uh, he's about 47 now, and he got the product about six weeks ago. And actually, he just sent them to me today, the emails and also the screenshots. But he had a crown balding spot. Mm -hmm. And one bottle of the product completely mm -hmm. regrew the hair on his balding spot. I mean, he's like freaked out over. He's like, oh my God. But the, I mean, again, if you, he's obviously very, you know, he's a biohacker, very advanced. He's living a very inflammation free lifestyle. Um, and he put that on there. He also knows not to use DHT blockers. But anyway, to get back to the point of what I was talking about with the DHT, I rabbit hole a little bit, is that you can definitely use those products and prevent further hair loss. But you have to understand that you're again, robbing Peter to pay Paul. And if you do go off, which I would suggest that you do, you want to use an angiogenic peptide based product, uh, half the day or not half the day, but at least like co uh, coincidental. So like, let's say you're using the DHT in the morning, you mm -hmm. would take the peptide product at night. Mm -hmm. You would titrate your dosage of the DHT, DHT product, probably by 20 to 30%. Mm -hmm. And then do the same thing over a four week process or a four week period while you're maintaining taking the angiogenic peptide based product at night so mm -hmm. that eventually the health of your follicles and your scalp is so much more enhanced that it will, it will minimize, if not eliminate altogether the demunization of withdrawing from the DHT. Cause that's what happens. The DHT is literally embedded in your scalp. Uh, I'm sorry. The DHT inhibitor is attached to all of the follicles in your scalp. And so when you stop taking it, rather than falling out, the peptide-based product will increase the health so much in the scalp that you won't lose all the hair that you would have normally without it. Does that make sense? Yes. And I remember um, I had Dr. Elizabeth Yurth on my podcast. I love I love Elizabeth. We're good friends. Yeah. And she said, oh, you're taking DHT. So she said, well, there goes your testosterone count. <laughs> and so then I went and had my testosterone uh, checked, but yet... I'm very, I've always had a very high testosterone. Good, good for me, right? That uh, for a woman. And, um, but this time it was way off the charts high. Yeah. And yeah. so what she said about going lower was actually in my case, not what happened. So we don't, yeah. we still don't know why. It could have been increased from the DHT blocking because again, you had naturally high DH, I'm, I'm sorry, naturally high testosterone normally. Uh, and then blocking the DHT actually, because remember DHT itself is a super high uh, anabolic amplifier. I mean, it's again, it's more anabolic than the testosterone molecule. So you're just one of those people that has like what is called cross chain linking yeah. and you had an opposite effect. And again, and this is why what you said earlier in the podcast, we're all biochemically unique. Yes. You know, everybody's going to have a separate response. There are no cookie cutter templatized yes. explanations for anything. We all have to track and see what happens. And if it doesn't work for you, you stop it. If it doesn't work for the, or it works for the other person, you continue. It's just, I always say with DHT inhibitors or AIs, there's absolutely a long-term negative consequential effect mm -hmm. if you continue to use those. And we know that from just the science. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's untold numbers of studies, Michelle, uh, in the medical literature. And again, I'm telling you, Big Pharma, I, I wrote an article about this. I mean, it's 4,600 words. Yeah, I want to read that article. They, they love to cover up the negative scientific evidence that shows that blocking DHT or blocking ar ar aromatase, which is obviously estradiol, which is ultimately estrogen, yes. um, is terrible. 
I mean, I mean, again, if we just talk about women with breast cancer, yes. the, the, the side effects that happen to women who use AIs and high dosages, which by the way, is what bodybuilders slash men on therapeutic testosterone are using in men. So how do they ever extrapolate that nonsense to this is insane. But like, I always say this to people, especially physicians when they come at me, because again, they're attempting, and we talked about this on your podcast, but they're attempting to keep a man's estrogen, similar to what a woman's is when they have cancer in this confined range, according to the laboratory panel ranges, which are also not made for people on hormones, but it's all ridiculous. But I say to them, like, whatever made you think that giving a women's stage four cancer drug to a man is valuable? And then they're, then they're like, well, you know, I never really thought about it like that. Well, I'm like, how would you not? That's what the des- drug is designed for, right? So, but if you ever talk to a woman who's had breast cancer right. and you ask them about taking um, Arimidex or ex- Examestane or, or there, you know, there's different names for them scientifically and then different generics for them now. But if you've ever taken one of those drugs and you ask them how they feel, they will tell you like death yeah. because those drugs, when they block estrogen, crush yeah. every biological system. I mean, I always say this and I'll say it again on the show. Estrogen is what confers protection in males and females to okay. all biological system functioning. You will not have strong bones. You will not have a strong brain. You will not have strong vasculature architecture. Right. I mean, you basically are walking around as a risk of having a bone fracture, a heart attack or neurodegenerative disease. Right. Right. It's, un- it's unreal how bad it all is. Now, again, you know, you'll get scientists, you know, for women that have breast cancer and they're saying, yeah, but Jay, they have a very aggressive form of metastasis in their breast and we have to control the estrogen and suppress it, you know, in the tumor. And it's like, okay, well, you know, again, it's like you're, as you were saying earlier in the thing, it's like you're knocking out the entire garden, yeah. which is all the biological systems to kill one weed. Right. Exactly. That's the antibiotic syndrome. (laughs) Exactly. The same thing. So, I mean, like we really have to be cognizant ourselves of what's going on. And it's like, you know, and and look, you and I know this, I mean, some people, and it's mostly the older generation, but you know, they love to listen to what their doctor says. And at the end of the day, it's like, okay, that may be great, but is that doctor truly looking out for your best interest? (laughs) Right. Or is that doctor looking out for his practice best interest, which is right. normally what they're doing because that's how they make their money. It's always like, you know, if you go to a surgeon um, to get a diagnostic test done right. and they find something and they say it's not cancerous, but then you ask them, well, what would you recommend they do? Well, they're a surgeon. They're going to recommend that they cut it out of you because it could become cancerous. Right. So I always say that to people. I'm like, you got to use discernment. You got to right. use your own judgment, you know, how do you feel if it's not cancer and it's not an effect for you right now? And you know, the risks of having an excision or a surgery. And I always tell people this, and you know, again, this is another one that it's not, most people don't know. And I dealt with this with my wife's mom. Do you realize that right now in the United States today, and so few people know this, that if you're 65 or older, and you have a surgical procedure, an invasive surgical procedure. They make you, doesn't matter what it is, an invasive surgical procedure. They make you sign a piece of paper, Michelle. This is in every hospital, private and public in the United States, that basically it's all legalese. It says that you realize that you have a 50%, not five or 15, 50 coin flip to die from post-surgical infection from, you already said it, the antibiotic, the, the, the overprescribing of antibiotics has literally created microbes and pathogens that are so resistant, they're, they literally lay on surgical steel. So if yeah. you have this invasive surgery at 65 or older, you have a 50% chance of dying from post-surgical infection. Nobody knows about this because again, they don't look at the fine print. They just sign the authorization when they get the surgery. And obviously, you know, most people do it through their insurance. But if a person gets a post-surgical infection from a routine surgery, and again, I'll give you a routine surgery. Many, many people between 65 and 75 who have, um, you know, what do you call it? Um, Colonoscopies. Oh, colonoscopies. They they get lesions 
that they find in there that are non-cancerous, but again, they recommend that they get them cut out. How many of those people die from post-surgical infections? Yeah, It's unbelievable the number. My wife's mom died from that. We went through you know, cross law, you know, legal count. We never ended up going through a suit. We attempted to, but then you find out that you got nobody to sue. You know, you're going to be hammered. They're going to destroy you in court. But that's the thing is, again, we don't pay attention. This -hmm. goes back to the technological enslavement. We don't pay attention to the things that we agree to. We always consent, but we don't look at the fine print. And that's what's happening now. Saying all this, Jay, because I looked at the list of what I had a I had a biking accident. I think I told you this a couple of years ago, and uh, fell off, uh, thrown off of an electric bike. I, I those electric bikes are uh, I I could go on for hours. About the case. <laughs> They're so dangerous. It's they not- are. And in my case, it had a life a mind of its own, and it just wouldn't go back into manual. Wow. Anyway, I was thrown off onto the concrete. Uh, road. I could have been killed, but yeah. uh, but anyway, I I it was right during COVID, so you know it was hard to even get a surgeon. I was lucky enough to have the the doctor for the San Francisco Giants became my surgeon, and you know he's a traditional doctor, but sure. uh, but afterwards I looked. This is afterwards, so this is why I'm saying it to you that you're so right. I afterwards I looked at what they gave me to put me out. And there was so much stuff in there, the propanol and whatever. Oh my God, dude. Yeah. Fentanyl and, uh, uh, you know, the fentanyl was what really caught my attention. And, and of course, you know, we don't know all these things. <laughs> but, you know, we're in a crisis and we know that we have to make a, you know, a, a choice. And hindsight, I probably, I broke my ankle, my tibia and fibula. And they said, if you don't do surgery, you may be an invalid or, you know, you won't be able to to walk correctly anymore. Right. Won't be the athlete that you are today. And you you know, they, they scared me because I couldn't give up the fact that I'm athletic and I can, you know, do things that a 20 year old can do um, or even beat them. So I was like, it was my ego that said, you know what, you cannot give up your athleticism. So I went for the surgery, and um, but when I saw afterwards all the, you know, first I had to wait in the hospital during COVID for like four hours, and you know, you know, there's all kinds of COVID patients around you, and I never had COVID, so I was probably, you know, you're like, honestly very lucky they didn't stick like six vaccines and five boosters well, in. You. Yeah, yeah, because they never, they, I think they did ask. I can't remember. It. Well, I, I think they asked me if I'd been vaccinated, but. That that really wasn't relevant. I don't I don't think it was fair that they would even ask that question because that's between you and your doctor, right? It's nuts, dude. But that back then they were doing all sorts of stuff. I, I mean, listen, I have a similar story. In 2021, I was involved in a car accident. I pulled out of my subdivision where I lived in Murrieta, California, you know, right north of San Diego. Yeah, I and I was it. driving a BMW M5, a, like the one of the top of the line cars that you could drive. Yeah. And a 76-year-old man and his 96-year-old mom oh. plowed into me, oh. destroyed the car. She ended up dying the next day. Oh. Nobody was sighted. But, you know, she was so old, they just basically say she died of, like, old age and shock. But uh, I had the same thing happen to me. I mean, both me and him were cut up and lacerated, you know, the airbags deployed. Uh, And she was fine, which is, you know, even stranger in the whole thing and everything. She was completely fine. They took her in for observation, and she ended up dying the next day. But the, the craziest part about this is I was sitting there on the ledge, you know, bleeding, and they had wrapped my leg. The ambulance was there, and the guy was there. I'm not kidding you was so cool. He was like an angel in disguise. He was like, he was like saying, so, so you don't want to say, or how was he saying? So, so you're not authorizing us taking you into the hospital so that you can be observed, right? This is in the height of the vaccine shit. And so he was kind of like communicating with me because he could tell that I was in shape and stuff. And then I really wasn't hurt that bad, but he was like letting me know without saying it because you know, there were a bunch of cops around. You don't want to come into the hospital dude because we may shoot you up who knows right so i mean he's like communicating with me on the background and and thankfully my wife got there like two minutes later because it was our it was in our subdivision she was out shopping and she you know she came up and saw my car completely totaled and me sitting on the curb all bloody and everything but like 
that I had the same thing happen. I mean, I mean, basically in 2020 what? and 2021, it was crazy in the hospital. But mine was 20 January 2021. And so wow. So yeah, so I was August of 2021. Yeah, and okay. in the height of all the insanity. Yeah. So you were in it too. So it's a we were both honestly the got our guardian angels were looking out for us. But I mean, just the whole point of of uh, going to a hospital, you know, I I I, I stay. I tell everyone if hospitals are the third. I think it's the third ki- uh, most common. Se- killer. Now, it's second now, second highest cause of death. Well, that's yep. probably because of COVID, right? Right. All- yep. 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 Well, and I mean, what, I mean, what is it? What is it when doctors kill you? There's I a word for that. For one. <laughs> Well, I forget to have, you know, there's like a Latin term for doctors killing people. But I mean, again, doctors are practicing medicine, right? right? They're not perfecting it. They're practicing it. Yeah. Well, good. I don't want to get off the GHG. So you're, you're, uh, you're, what you've said today is, is so incredibly helpful. So I'm, I think what I'm going to start doing is I, I've been taking two DHT blockers in the morning and using your now that I have the Intera product, I use that a little bit on my scalp in the evening. That's all you need to use is just put that on and see what happens. I mean, and, but take that take so 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 go half uh, half amount of your DHT in the morning. Yeah, and then eventually, I I I would say truthfully, like just two weeks because that stuff is strong. The other stuff are you know when we first came up with the strategy, that was when we had Oxano, which was a version two product. The version three product is so much stronger. I think you probably only need two weeks of titrating down with the DHT inhibitor because your 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 hair will be really strong after two weeks of using the Oxana. How long have you been using the Antara now? Well, only for about four, five days now because I just got it. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah. So do that for like do that use it use it for about two or three weeks and then start coming off the DHT inhibitor completely so you don't have any hair loss. But here's the thing, my my um, t- uh, testosterone, the last test was 1,800. Wow. <laughs> I know, wow. that's higher than most men. Yeah. The, the test in March was only down, it had gone way down. I had been taking the DHT blocker, so it first went down, then all of a sudden it skyrocketed. And my, my doc, they, even the lab called my doctor and said her, her you know, levels are, are, are way over the range. So I don't know what do we're what taking any type of supplements that were like, you know, well, you I, know, any kind of aphrodisiac type. So, Cause all those supplements that they have stuff in there, you don't, you, you don't really know what they're putting in there. No, I don't take any, I don't need it. <laughs> well, no, I know. But like, sometimes if you take a supplement, that, that's why I don't trust the supplemental industry at all. I mean, I, cause you don't know what they're putting in their products. There's no sterility process and control. You know, they can put anything they want in there and label it, whatever they want. Exactly. That's exactly what my doctor had said. Is it's getting so bad out there with all the the um, charlatans that it's almost like the pharmaceutical industry. We could do a whole podcast on the charlatans because, believe me, you know I have no filter and I have no problem saying it. And it's some of the biggest names out there. They sell these bogus bullshit products. Look, uh, I told you, I said to you on the podcast the last time, and I'll say it again. When people say, "How do I raise therapy? How do I raise testosterone?" I said, "There's two ways." You can live your lifestyle incredibly inflammation, low, low inflammation and be super anal retentive and obviously, you know, get a lot of uh, wild caught fish, a lot of a perfect blend of, um, you know, polyunsaturated um, essential fatty acids, increase arachidonic acid and be blessed genetically like someone like you are or and this is the only or you can use therapeutic testosterone. But all I, the other shit that they're out there talking yeah. about, Tonkat Ali, Fenugreek, yeah. all this stuff. I've spent 10 years of my life researching all of that stuff. Yeah. And any increase in any study was transient at best. Yeah. And never enough to optimize testosterone. So again, no matter who the person is that's selling you, you know, again, Turkesterone or Fenugreek or Tonkat Ali or right. Phagodosia or whatever these things are, it's supplement hype. They're using their brand to sell the product. It will not under any circumstances optimize your testosterone. That doesn't mean, and you know this, that there, the placebo effect is not real. And if you really dr- truly believe in the supplement you're taking, that you can't manifest an outcome. But mm-hmm. over time, Michelle, you're not going to see hormonal optimization. And again, it's not about replacement or normalcy. We're talking about optimization. 
You're not going to see that with any of those supplements. It's just not going to happen. They don't do it. I don't care who says it or who sells it or what bullshit they represent about it. It doesn't work. And anybody who's been in this business long enough, including the medical field, who's familiar with hormone optimization will say the same thing because they don't see it clinically ever, not consistently. Well, I, I know that our podcast has been widely viewed since you, since we did it. Awesome. And, and I'm so happy because you spent, you know, a lot of your valuable uh, time and wisdom sharing with people so much depth in this, in that subject of testosterone. So, um, you know, I know we have to end soon and I have uh, people coming, so I have to say goodbye to you. So, but I, I as I said to you earlier today, with offline, uh, we have, we just have one of those amazing symbiotic uh, uh, chemistry dialogue ability and that we could just go on for hours. Well, why don't you just have me, let's just keep it going. Just, you have me come back on. We'll talk peptides. We'll talk that, peptides and fat loss, which we haven't hit, which will be huge. Cause obviously the book is out there right now, 30 days to shreds, which I think you have. So it'll give you some time to go through the PDF and you can buy the paperback because it's available now. Although there is a delay because so many people are buying it, but I would love to talk about fasting with you because we just wrote an article, which we'll publish on my website today, uh, going over Peter Atia and Thor, whatever his name is, the actor's uh, longevity series about fasting because they're all wrong biochemically in there. And so today's article is like, okay, this is where they're right, which they do. They're right in some places, but here's where they're wrong. And then we relate it to that book. And as you know, and I just did a really awesome podcast with all the docs last night on the health optimization doctors roundtable. Um, it's important for people today who are using GLP-1 agonist peptides, which are all the rage in the world, yeah. to know how to do those correctly because yeah. the majority of doctors who prescribe them do not give their patients the right advice. And yeah. there is bone mineral density loss. There is muscle loss. There yeah. is thyroid uh, destruction and metabolism destruction. Because again, if you don't know how to use those in the context of dieting correctly, you will have issues. And so it's like, it's gotta be important that we clarify and hopefully on your, on your podcast, that is a great place to do that on yeah. how people can use these things and do them within the con in the context of health and longevity. Well, how about this? I, I think what you said is one of the most important uh, topics for today, for, for the next time when we, when we schedule your, you coming on my podcast the next yep. time. Uh, I would like to lead off with, uh, with the weight loss subject. Next for sure. We still have to cover peptides and, pep and, and bioregulators. We can wrap them in. We can definitely wrap them in. But yeah, fat loss is the biggest thing on the planet right now, Michelle. Uh, 70. We, so how about this statistic? Last night, I had not seen this statistic, but Dr. Rudy from MHI Life said that right now they now know that over the, so 40 years old and up in the United States, age 40 and up, 76% of the adult population are obese, not fat, obese. That, that's gone up. It used to be like 68, and that was horrible. 76% of 40-year-old people are obese. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, we are literally, you and I are aberrations now. Yes. Healthy people are outliers now. Yes. Outliers. We're mutants. It's insane. Yes. But, I mean, let's face it. Like, it's our job now to help people not be obese. And there are these amazing tools and technologies that if you just have a little bit of know-how and a little bit of experience as far as like how to do it, you can have tremendous weight loss and tremendous results and keep it off, right? I mean, that's one of the main things we write about in my book, an entire chapter on maintenance. Okay, I got to where I want to go and now how do I stay here? Because as you know, most fat loss diets don't ever tell people on how to maintain. They just tell them how to get there and then they leave them hanging. And then they often gain it back and then. Oh, and more and more. Yeah. Cause they destroy their metabolism. All the, the juice fasts and the water fasts right. and all the Hollywood nonsense. Right. It works. Right. And then you destroy your metabolism and your thyroid and you basically regain weight plus. Right. That's going to be the subject. So let's do that. Let's awesome. uh, I will ask my um, assistant to schedule with your assistant for a follow-up for the next Maybe in, uh, let's see, we are today, October 5th. 
So how do you feel about uh, uh, maybe one month from now? November? Yeah. So, so it, it would probably be, it would have to be under one month because I leave for Thailand on November 10th and I won't be back until November 29th. So most okay. of November I'll be gone. So if we could do it in early November, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll do it maybe because um, my birthday is November 1st. Maybe you can be my birthday gift. <laughs> Well, happy birth, happy early birthday! But yeah. let me look at my calendar right now. November first is on a Wednesday. Perfect. Both uh, first and second are open. Yeah, I, I think the second because um, as the first, who knows what I'm going to be doing? Awesome, awesome. <laughs> but uh, the, the second is a Thursday, and that's usually the good day for you and me. Perfect so, for both of us. Gonna, I'm going to target with my um, assistant, and so we'll be back in touch. Jay, thank you so so much. I really. But as always, I learned so much from you and I hope that it's been mutual. Yeah, no, it's been absolutely amazing. And you guys and gals uh, that watch the Jay Campbell podcast, please support Michelle at agelessandtimeless.com. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon. I love that. Thank you, Jay. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.